Imagine being on an overnight flight to Hong Kong. The cabin is dark and most of the passengers are sleeping. Suddenly the plane starts making some strange maneuvers. It turns 90 degrees and flies on its side, then turns straight down pressing you back with more than 4 Gs of force. After making some recovery, you're now in an unreal weightless freefall. If you didn't know better, you'd think a child was wildly playing with the controls. Unfortunately in this case, you wouldn't be wrong. This is the fatal breakdown of the Aeroflot Flight 593 crash. In March of 1994, Aeroflot Flight 593 was traveling from Moscow to Hong Kong with a fairly routine flight plan. The three pilots would be rotating turns at the helm since this was a long flight. The captain of the group would finish his shift and move to the cabin for some rest. The relief pilot, Yaroslav Kudrinsky, took over as captain. His co-pilot was First Officer Igor Piskaryov. The two pilots had a combined 15,000 hours of flight time, including 1,400 hours in the A310. The Airbus A310-300 was a brand new advanced aircraft in the Aeroflot fleet. These pilots had the majority of their hours on Russian-made planes, which had slightly different standards on warnings and limits for operation. These subtle differences may have been the tragic difference between a miraculous recovery and a fiery crash. In addition to the pilot and co-pilot, there was actually a third pilot in the cockpit that night. Vladimir Makarov was another Aeroflot pilot riding as a passenger on this flight. As a courtesy, he was allowed to sit in one of the jump seats behind the pilots. As the quiet of the overnight flight set in, the captain decided to allow a couple visitors into the cockpit. This unusual event was actually an exciting circumstance for Captain Kudrinsky. His children were on this flight since they were scheduled to have a short vacation together in Hong Kong. The plane was flying on autopilot, the course was set, and this was the uneventful portion of the flight for pilots. His 15-year-old son Eldar and 13-year-old daughter Yana entered the cockpit at 12.40 a.m. The initial banter revealed a proud father showing his complicated job as a commercial captain to his impressed children. After just a few minutes, Captain Kudrinsky steps out of his seat and Yana takes his place. The moment he removed his harness to stand, he should have transferred control of the plane to the co-pilot. At this point, Igor Piskarov had his seat pushed back in a relaxed position without really being able to reach all of the flight controls. If the captain had transferred control formally, Piskaryov would have moved his seat forward and placed his hands on the control wheel. It was a seemingly small error, but as we'll see, small errors can add up to be a huge mistake. As the captain moved out, he moved Yana in. It was a harmless exchange, considering the plane was on autopilot and it would allow her to get a closer look. She spent a few minutes looking around, asking a few questions and touching the control wheel. Her father suggested that she turn the wheel to the left and fly the plane. She did as he asked, and the plane quickly turned to the left. As a child, I'm sure the magical feeling of controlling this huge plane was thrilling, but Captain Kudrinsky had performed a little magic of his own. He quickly turned a knob to direct the plane to the left. He was following a procedure that he had performed hundreds of times. While the plane was in fact on autopilot, there are ways for the pilots to take control of one function or another. The captain pulled out the heading select knob and directed the plane to the left by 15 degrees. In simple terms, this meant that the wings would essentially dip 15 degrees on the left side, causing the plane to roll towards the left. In this case, the autopilot was still controlling the speed and altitude. It also still had the programmed route waiting to be resumed. As soon as the captain pushed the knob back in, the autopilot would resume the programmed heading and continue on with the planned flight. A pilot might use this function to direct the plane around a storm, then resume the autopilot course once it's passed. After Yana had experienced turning the controls for a moment, she was ready to get out of the seat and turn to get up. The captain quickly spoke up. Getting in and out of the seat can be a risky task if you don't know what you're doing. There are rudder pedals on the ground and numerous buttons and switches near knees and elbows that a child might not notice. Captain Kudrinsky told her to go slow and slide out carefully. So far, it seems that the show and tell was going as expected, and mostly all attention and care was being directed to cockpit safety. The autopilot was in full control, and all five individuals in the cockpit were relaxed and enjoying this break from the routine. At 12.51, it was Eldar's turn to take a closer look. He slid into the captain's seat and started eyeing the various buttons and readouts. After a few minutes at 12.54, Eldar asked if he could turn the plane, and the captain repeated the maneuver. 
The guest pilot Makarov suggested that Captain Kudrensky adjust the main screen to show the horizon visual, so Eldar could see the angle on the screen. The time was 12.55, and the heading select knob was pushed back in. The autopilot was fully engaged as far as anyone could tell. At this point, Yana started asking her father if she could head back to her seat in the cabin. They were discussing that she should be quiet and not disturb the first-class passengers, when Eldar spoke up with a question. This called the attention of all three pilots to the instruments. They were all a bit confused by the turn. No one had been fully engaged with the flight controls for several minutes, so reorienting themselves to what was going on took precious seconds. When a plane is required to circle an airport for landing, called a holding pattern, it often enters what they call a zone. The flight would follow a prescribed circling pattern that was like an oval shape around the airport. On the instrument display, the previous straight line would have curved around in a U-shape, showing the full turn that was planned in the programmed course. This zone pattern was the only explanation for why the autopilot would be taking them around in a circle. The confusing part was that they were nowhere near an airport. So why the holding pattern? Over the 20 seconds they spent looking and discussing, the plane had banked more than 45 degrees. This exceeds the maneuvering capabilities of the autopilot, and the plane attempted to correct the speed and altitude in regards to this angled position. The changes were instantly alarming, and the pilots moved to resolve the issue. At this point it was 12.56, alarms were going off regarding the altitude and bank angle. The autopilot was now fully disengaged. The plane was banking at an incredible 90 degrees, while the nose was pointing down at a 50 degree angle. This means they were barreling towards the ground at nearly 500 miles per hour. The direction and speed of the plane was now generating 4.6 Gs of force, which exceeds the structural limitations of the plane. This force kept Piskaryov from being able to pull forward and fully engage the controls. It also kept Eldar and Captain Kudrensky from being able to change places. During this time, the co-pilot was trying to slow the plane by reducing thrust and pulling up on the nose, but he greatly overcorrected the situation. These actions, along with an accidental rudder pedal push by Eldar when switching places, caused a stall and then a nightmarish spiral down out of control. Just moments before, the passengers would have been pressed into their seats while turned completely on their sides. It would have been madness to wake up to these wild shifts in angle, heavy G-forces, and then, in this moment, pure weightlessness. The G-force reduced to zero as they fell out of the sky. It was now 12.57, and Captain Kudrensky was back in his seat. The deadly spin was now coming under control, and Captain Kudrinsky was confident that things were going to be fine. Unfortunately, at this point, they were less than 1,000 feet above the ground, 
and that was just not enough. At 12.58, they crashed into the ground. The captain's final words were, So how did this happen? The plane had absolutely no failures and performed just as it was designed to do. The problem was a feature that the pilots just weren't familiar with. Under normal circumstances, in the Russian planes they'd mostly piloted, an alarm would sound when any part of the autopilot was disengaged. The Airbus A310 made an audible alarm when the autopilot was fully disengaged, but it only alerted with a silent indicator light when just one of the systems was shut down. The captain was completely unaware that while Eldar was turning the control wheel, the plane started counting down to autopilot shutoff of the longitudinal roll controls. So while Captain Kudrinsky was talking to Yana about returning to her seat, Eldar was continuing to turn the control wheel slightly. After 30 seconds, the autopilot system took this turning action to mean that the pilot needed to override whatever the autopilot had programmed. The pilots never heard an alarm that the autopilot was interrupted so they continued with the belief that the autopilot must be turning the plane for a programmed reason. This misunderstanding wasted precious seconds of potential recovery. During this time, the plane's autopilot was still controlling the speed and altitude which caused some unknown changes to angles, speed and direction of the plane, without the pilots registering those shifts. All of this happened in just a few minutes. Eldar asked to turn the control at 12.54. He asked why it turned by itself just one minute later. The plane was banking hard for the next minute, and by 12.56, all the pilots were aware of the dangerous conditions and were frantically trying to figure out what was happening. It was only two minutes until the flight came to a fiery end at 12.58. It's hard to say what factor was most responsible for this crash. Was it the design that did not give the pilots an audible warning that autopilot was disengaged? Or was it the untrained teenager turning the control wheel? These combined conditions resulted in all 75 passengers on board being killed instantly on impact, in a completely devastating loss of life. After this crash, Airbus made adjustments to their autopilot system and banking angle limits for their future aircraft.